Welcome to the Archaeology Studio. Today's episode considers caves and tunnels in archaeology, popular fiction, and fantasy game settings. I already produced another video about caves as specialized venues in archaeology. In this new video here, I want to focus on how caves and tunnels can be represented in technical scientific reporting and in various works of fiction. Caves and tunnels have been featured often in the science fiction and fantasy genre, in countless novels, movies, television shows, and games such as Dungeons and Dragons, among others. I should start with a simple distinction between caves and tunnels. Caves appear as cavities in the ground, and tunnels are artificial creations. In many cases, a natural cave has been modified by human action, including tunneling, among other possible alterations. Caves, and to some extent tunnels, have been pervasive throughout the world and throughout most of human cultural history. Many caves as geological formations date back millions of years old, and therefore they have been part of the human experience throughout our evolutionary history. The oldest known cave sites in archaeology are more than 100,000 years old. People have created artificial tunnels for transportation routes, aqueducts, sewer systems, secret passages, and other purposes mostly during the last several hundreds of years, and the oldest known examples have been dated as early as 2000 BC. In principle, any geological formation could include a cave. The physical geology will influence the size, shape, and other characteristics of a cave or other cavity in the ground. Some basic knowledge of geology and of cave formations can clarify where to look for caves and what to expect in the size and morphology of a cave. This information is essential in archaeology for finding potential cave sites and for describing the environmental context. These details may not seem necessary in works of fiction, but they could enable more realistic representation and open opportunities for more storytelling and narrative themes. Most of the world's caves are found in limestone geology, and many others are found in volcanic formations. For this video, I will concentrate on these most prevalent occurrences, and you should know that many other possibilities exist. Limestone and volcanic formations of course are different in their geological origins and in their material compositions. Moreover, they create significantly dissimilar cave environments. In the simplest terms, limestone caves tend to form horizontally or in shapes of sinkholes, and volcanic caves tend to form in elongate alignments inside lava tubes flowing down a slope. Limestone formations originally were living coral reefs, just beneath the surface of the ocean. A coral reef grows in a horizontal platform, parallel with the ocean surface. A reef platform can be quite extensive, although it may include a number of breaks or openings. Corals can grow only in ocean water, and therefore any sources of fresh water will disallow coral growth. Whenever the sea level has lowered, then the top of a coral reef platform could be exposed above the water level. Additionally, geological uplift could push a coral reef upward. After a coral reef has been exposed above sea level, then the corals no longer can live, and the material becomes limestone. New mechanical and chemical weathering processes then can degrade and transform the limestone, including the creation of caves and other cavities. 
Given the overall horizontal formation of the limestone, caves tend to be found in similar horizontal positions. Often, limestone caves are found within a uniform elevation zone. If the vertical position of the limestone has shifted through time, then caves could be found in multiple elevation spots. Additionally, multiple limestone terraces may have formed through long time scales of changing sea level and geological uplift, and each terrace in a sequence may include caves in separate elevation zones. When a coral reef first is exposed above sea level, then its outer edge becomes exposed to wave cutting and to some extent marine organisms, usually resulting in a tidal notch. A tidal notch forms in a parabolic shape, and usually the resulting cavity is a simple overhang shelter. These shelter areas typically intrude only a few meters into the side of a rock formation, and they remain in lighted areas without a true dark zone of a cave. A larger cave could form here when other erosional processes meet with the edge of the tidal notch formation. I should note that tidal notches occur in almost every limestone formation, and they could occur in other geological rocks. In addition to the tidal notches in limestone, cavities and caves can form through numerous weathering processes. Sometimes, patches of different coral species can decay at separate rates through time, and some could be more fragile and vulnerable than others. Slightly acidic rainwater will interact with the calcium carbonate of limestone, resulting in cavity formations. Any later developments of overlaying sediments, vegetation, or other overburdening material could cause fracture or collapse of certain portions of a limestone mass. In limestone terrain, horizontal caves typically occur along the outer edges of a limestone formation. Meanwhile, sinkholes can open vertical shafts, and these shafts could connect with horizontal cavities in the limestone. Limestone is known for its overall porosity, and water can drain through it. In this setting, the downward draining water carries organics and minerals with it when it travels through the porous limestone, resulting in drips and spiliothems inside a cave. Those spiliothems on the ceiling of a cave are known as stalactites, while those on the ground are known as stalagmites. When they connect together, then they form columns. This terminology is simple, but frequently the words are misused in popular fiction and gaming settings. In fictional and fantasy settings of caves, sometimes a creature is camouflaged in the ceiling or floor. As much as I like this idea, I encourage to think critically about how a creature might blend into a setting with speleothems, water dripping, spider webs, tiny insects, moths, bats, and possibly other small animals. In some cases, a cave wall or a speleothem column could be an easier place for a creature to hide in camouflage. The water dripping from a ceiling is most prevalent in porous limestone formations. In some cultural traditions, people have collected dripping water from these sources, and sometimes pools of water can accumulate on the cave floor. Cave water in many cases could be regarded with ritual or ceremonial qualities. In fantasy settings such as in Dungeons & Dragons, cave water might contain magical properties. In some cases, though, cave water is mostly a practical resource, for example when people hide inside a cave during times of warfare. Sometimes cave water is the only permanent ground source of fresh water in a limestone environment. In formations such as in northern Guam, the limestone has not been eroded with stream drainages, and instead the water drains straight downward through the limestone and into the aquifer that floats just above sea level. 
these sources of water can be accessed inside some but not all caves, as well as at occasional seepage flows near the shoreline. In these contexts, cave water can be a precious resource, combining practical and ritual qualities. Of course, not every limestone cave extends into the water table or aquifer. Usually, this situation is possible only in the most recent limestone formations that have not yet been separated too far above sea level. In rare cases, a cave may extend deeper into the ocean water. Through time, the accessibility of water inside a cave can change due to the fluctuations in sea level and movement of the limestone terrain. In some places, caves and sinkholes open downward into the water table and possibly into the lower ocean water. Some of these places have been used as natural wells, as ritual offering centers, or as holding tanks for special turtles, eels, or other animals. In my view, these places are ideal for interpreting into a science fiction or fantasy setting. I should mention briefly about submarine caves. Usually, caves do not form entirely underwater, but instead some part of the process involves exposure of the limestone above sea level. Later, if the sea level might rise again, or if the geological formation undergoes significant subsidence, then the caves and cavities could become submerged under the ocean. In rare cases, a sinkhole or other cavity might form while the coral reef is in the process of being exposed above sea level. In any case, underwater caves naturally are difficult for anyone to access, but they can be extraordinary environments in works of fiction and fantasy settings. Typically, they are regarded as places of mystery and danger. In at least a few caves that I know, a constrained space goes downward where different gases could accumulate. Breathable air could be problematic. Some of the gases could be poisonous or flammable. These factors have been mentioned fairly often in works of fiction about deep caves and especially about mining tunnels. But I am not aware of many such instances in fantasy gaming settings. The base of a cave always is the bedrock of the associated geological formation, and typically it is covered by later accumulations of sediments and debris. Most often, fallen rubble from the ceiling will cover the floor of a cave, and people may add more material in forms of discarded food emittents and artifacts. Moreover, decayed organic matter and perishable materials can disintegrate essentially into sediments, and additional sedimentary material could come from other natural sources. For instance, bat guano can create extraordinarily thick sedimentary units inside a cave. Bat guano sediments have been known as natural habitats for varieties of spores, fungal growths, insects, and other forms of life. These conditions typically are not included in most fictional or fantasy settings, perhaps because of the extensive industrial mining of guano deposits since the 1800s. Most people making fictional and fantasy world settings today probably never would have seen a cave with a thick bat guano deposit and associated ecology. In most parts of the world, bat guano deposits have persisted through the 1800s. In Peru, in South America, an exceptional case occurred where people used bat guano as gardening fertilizer, at least since 1500 years ago and perhaps as early as 5000 years ago. In caves with considerable mineral water dripping from the ceiling, the soft sediments on the floor could become solidified. This outcome happens usually when the rate of mineral water dripping 
has been greater than the rate of any other activity on the cave floor. In many of the limestone caves where I have excavated, the surface of the floor was solid, but my excavations revealed deeper layers of loose and soft sediments. In most cases, a cave entrance retains soft sediments and loose rubble debris on the surface. The farther you move into the cave interior, the more likely you will encounter a hardened cave floor surface or the natural bedrock exposure of the cave floor. I will present more about caves generally, but first I want to mention about caves in volcanic geology. Volcanoes always rise upward and create descending slopes around their edges. In this setting, caves are formed on sloped terrain, following the paths of lava tubes that naturally flow down a slope. Lava tubes could occur anywhere along the slopes of a lava flow. They may not be accessible, however, unless a portion of the outer edge or ceiling has collapsed. Lava tubes can branch in different directions of flows, just like a river or stream can branch while flowing down a slope. In other words, the branching occurs only in a downslope direction, and it never occurs in an upslope direction. In a lava tube complex, the numbers of branching tubes can be complicated. People can become lost, even when carrying a map or creating a map along the way. In some cases, people in the past created small pilings of stacked rocks or other indicators to signify where a traveler should go or should avoid. Travel inside a lava tube always involves a slope or incline. The degree of the slope depends on the shape of the original volcano and terrain. In cases of steeper slopes, walking down a slope could be faster or less exhausting, while walking up a steep slope could be slower or more exhausting. In addition to the direction and degree of a slope inside a cave, movement can be affected by the possibly difficult terrain of uneven ground and loose rubble, as well as by the obscured conditions of lighting inside a cave. I would add one more sensory factor of sound inside a cave, wherein sounds can be amplified, distorted, and echoed. These factors create a unique sensory experience inside any cave in limestone terrain, in a volcanic lava tube, or anywhere else. In most volcanic terrain, multiple lava flows have occurred, overlaying one another. The more recent lava flows will cover the older flows, partially or completely, including covering of the older cave formations. In this way, the most ancient caves in some volcanic formations have become sealed and protected deep underground. They could become accessible through artificial tunneling, extensive mining, or other major landscape transformations. These kinds of locations could link with numerous folklore traditions about an underdark world or ancient history. Inside a lava tube cave, dripping water is much less prevalent than can be seen inside a limestone cave. You might see shapes that look like stalactites and stalagmites, but they were formed by the molten lava of the lava tube cooling down from liquid into solid form. The process is like when dripping liquid water freezes into a solid icicle. But in this case, the raw material involves molten lava that solidifies into volcanic rock. Thereafter, water drips are rare inside lava tube caves, and these environments tend not to support further formations of stalactites or stalagmites. Lava tube caves follow elongate paths, radiating outward down a slope. As a result, some of these passages could be followed for several kilometers. In places such as Hawaii and to some extent in Samoa, these long lava tubes have been used as secret escape routes. However, these same passages could be infiltrated and exploited by an invading force. 
Some of these caves have been protected with camouflaged entrances and exits to avoid detection, and the interiors have been reinforced with stacked stonework features and other defenses. The long passages and branches of lava tubes are significantly different from the shapes of limestone caves. Most limestone caves are oval-shaped chambers, possibly connecting with side chambers. Limestone caves can be more complicated, however, in places where water had been flowing for an extended period of time, thus creating more modifications in the original simple shapes of the limestone cavities. I should clarify that caves are not places where people could live formally for long periods of time. Rather, people used these caves in specialized contexts for short periods of time. These circumstances may have involved practicalities of temporary shelter, or they may have involved ritual ceremonies, emergency refuge, or other special purposes. These specialized circumstances may have been repeated numerous times, but each individual instance would have been contained within just a few hours or perhaps an overnight period. Living permanently inside a cave is not possible for human beings. The lack of sunlight would create serious health problems within a few weeks. If people are producing fire and smoke inside an enclosed cave, then even more health problems will develop rather quickly. Additionally, if people stay inside an enclosed cave for some days without venturing outside the cave, then the waste disposal inside the enclosed living space could generate deadly consequences. Furthermore, these problems are combined with the mental health issues that affect people inside caves. Only some specialized kinds of life forms can live permanently inside a cave. In folklore traditions, imaginary creatures such as troglodytes or kobolds might live inside caves, where they shun the sunlight of the outside world. Many caves are known as places of shelter or temporary camping. They provide natural protection during intense weather or during an overnight rest. In caves with small openings, a camping shelter may be enhanced by building a wall of stacked stones across the opening. This construction provides protection against invaders or predators, and it can help for retaining heat inside a cave. Potentially, at least some of these stones could be heated in a fire before they are stacked into a wall construction, and then they would continue to radiate heat for some time. This practice avoids the creation of a fire with smoke inside the enclosed space of a cave. In caves with large and tall openings, people could live here with sufficient sunlight and air circulation. These settings could be described as habitation sites. Notably though, the habitation context does not extend into a permanent dark zone or into an enclosed space of a cave. As I have shown here, caves are extraordinary places. People use caves for purposes other than ordinary life in houses and villages. In terms of archaeological evidence, caves reveal aspects of ancient activities that were substantially different from regular daily residential sites. The kinds of food remains and artifacts tend to be specialized for camping events or for ritual ceremonies. Among the clearest indications of ceremonial contexts are the instances of rock art at caves. Especially inside the dark zones of caves, rock art can be linked with numerous ritual and ceremonial themes. Sometimes rock art may be situated in the light zone of a cave or even at the entrance opening, perhaps serving as a visible signal about the cave's interior. Rock art tends to occur in three basic colors that could be applied in various shapes and motifs, depending on the specific traditions of a cultural group and time period. 
black colors of rock art usually were made by charcoal or soot. They can be virtually undetectable inside a cave unless you already know where to look with a light source, or if the black color was applied over contrasting white color of the limestone. White colors of rock art usually were made by calcium carbonate, such as from slaked lime. They are easily visible even within dim light or indirect light. Reddish or yellowish colors of rock art generally were made from ochre or hematite minerals. They sometimes blend into the surrounding natural rock color. In most cases, the paints or pigments were combined with other ingredients, such as a binding agent that could enhance the stickiness for adhering to a cave surface. Carved images are either scratched or pecked into the rock surface. Most of these shapes are simple lines or circles unless metal tools are involved for more refined control of the outcomes. Usually though, when people are using metal tools, then they are using caves quite differently than would have been the case during older time periods without metal tools. Rock art can be highly distinctive of a cultural group, of a particular practice by that group or subgroup, and of a time period, especially in caves that have been used for numerous centuries or millennia the rock art traditions could refer to multiple different contexts. Older rock art from an ancient time period could be overlain by newer rock art from a more recent time period. These overlays could signify that the older rock art was no longer relevant or applicable in the later context, although the precise implications are open to interpretation. I made another video about rock art in archaeology, but here I want to emphasize that rock art can be a significant part of defining the context of a cave. Due to the highly specialized nature of rock art and of caves, the meaning can become lost after a few centuries. In archaeology, rock art requires careful descriptive recording and then numerous subjective interpretations could be developed. These interpretations are notoriously difficult to prove or disprove. Often the potential supporting evidence is either non-existent or inconclusive. In works of fiction or fantasy gaming settings, the vague and enigmatic qualities of rock art could be embraced as a source of mystery, but more often people want to find at least some degree of a satisfying conclusion at some point. In these cases, I would encourage to consider the time period and the cultural context of the rock art and of the larger cave environment that could relate with the themes of the work of fiction or fantasy gaming setting. In addition to the practices of rock art, people have modified caves with other features. Especially at the exterior openings of caves, a natural rocky shelf can provide a convenient surface for making a grinding basin or a set of grinding basins. These features could serve diverse purposes of grinding foods, of preparing the ingredients for rock art, or for measuring, pounding, or otherwise processing various materials. Grinding basins are found outside caves in many regions of the world, yet somehow they tend to be overlooked in works of fiction or in designs of gaming environments. Inside a cave, a natural rock surface could be used as a shelf or storage area for a light source or for hiding a valuable item. These aspects can add extra realism when representing what a cave environment looks like. Additionally, these features could inspire inventive storytelling devices. Whenever I explore in a cave, then I always make sure to observe from a safe distance before I enter. First of all, spiderwebs are a good indication that nobody has moved through this particular spot, at least for a little while. 
Second, I use my other senses to detect the possible sounds or smells of an animal, such as a pig that may be trapped and frightened inside the cave. Next, I follow standard protocols for exploring safely through a cave. I like to look for signs of broken stalactites on the ceiling or stalagmites on the ground. Fresh breaks are clear indications that someone or something has moved through this spot recently. Tiny speleothems can be broken quite easily, especially when a person or animal moves through a constrained space and makes a streak of continuous contact against the floor or ceiling. In scientific reporting, the physical shapes and environments of caves are recorded and represented in a number of different formats. Standard procedures and conventions do exist for noting the geological features, and most importantly, the output should depict the features accurately and consistently. Moreover, printed maps should convey a sense not only of the plan view shapes, but also the section view shapes of a cave. Three-dimensional registration, photography, and video recording always are helpful, and ideally these records can be linked with the conventional maps that appear on a printed page or on a computer screen. The way that I would explore a cave as an archaeologist shares many similarities with the concerns of a fictional character exploring into a cave. Archaeology research publications understandably focus on the end results of a cave documentation, and the adventure of cave exploration usually is not even mentioned. In contrast, the act of cave exploration is the primary focus of a work of fiction. In this case, I would encourage content creators to consider more about the reality of cave environments. So far in this video, I have described the major aspects of caves in limestone formations and volcanic terrain. I should note that considerably more detail and nuance could be considered. Overall, though, the information here offers a general sense of how caves are formed geologically and how they are used culturally. You could extrapolate or investigate more of these details on your own. Now I want to mention about tunnels as artificial creations. People can make tunnels almost anywhere. For practical safety concerns, solid rock formations are preferable for tunneling. In unstable areas, however, reinforcements can be added, for instance with timbers or other supports inside a tunnel. As artificial constructions, tunnels usually serve specific practical purposes. Many tunnels were made as defensive positions, and others were made for underground transportation of people, vehicles, water, and sometimes sewage. In these cases, tunnels do not involve the ritual or ceremonial context of natural caves. Sometimes a natural cave is modified with artificial tunneling. In these instances, tunneling adds specific useful spaces around the edges of a natural cave formation. In these situations, the labor investment in tunneling can be minimized. In a large-scale view, tunneling became more prevalent whenever people gained access to metal tools that could cut through rock more easily than stone tools. In fact, tunneling technology and engineering closely followed the historical developments of mining for the metal sources that would be used in manufacturing metal tools. During times of warfare or other conflicts, tunnels can become more popular. They are used for secret passageways, for defensive positions, or for hidden ambush locations. In these contexts, tunnel openings often are camouflaged, and various traps could be installed for thwarting any unwanted visitors. At the end of wartime, some soldiers or independent civilians may continue hiding inside tunnels. 
caves or other places. Often the victorious side of the conflict will make an effort to find these hiding places, and many tunnels and other sites are damaged or destroyed in the process. In concluding this episode, I hope that I have given you information or inspiration to think about caves and tunnels more effectively in archaeology reporting and in works of popular fiction and fantasy game settings. This video did not consider every detail about caves and tunnels. My other videos in this channel offer more information, and you always can share your ideas and questions in the comment section of this video. Please remember to subscribe to this channel, share with your friends, and explore more online videos with the Archaeology Studio.